Hello, my name is Bo Bothwell. I'm Associate Professor of Music at Kalamazoo College. I'm also former chair of the Society for Arab Music Research and a member of Kalamazoo's own Middle Eastern music group, the Bahar Ensemble. I'm delighted to be a part of the Fretboard Festival this year and to have the chance to tell you a little bit about this instrument, the Oud, an instrument that is, has a history going back at least a couple thousand years and that it's played today across Central and Southwest Asia and the Middle East, North Africa, and of course, here in Michigan. It's perhaps appropriate that I'm sitting here in Stetson Chapel at Kalamazoo College next to our beautiful organ, built by Helmuth Wolf in 1981. Just as the pipe organ was famously called King of the Instruments by Mozart in 18th century Vienna, the Oud is known as Sultan al-Alat, or Sultan of the Instruments across the Arabic-speaking world. As far away as 15th century Afghanistan, the Chathagay Turkish poet Ahmadi of Herat, in a long poem describing a contest between instruments, described the Oud as Shah of the Instruments for its versatility and grace, claiming its centrality across Persian culture as well. Within the tremendous breadth of history and geography that this instrument is a part of, I can't talk about everything today, so I want to focus on the role of the oud in Europe, and in particular how this instrument is related to some of the other instruments that you might hear at the Fretboard Festival. We can start a discussion of the influence of the oud on European fretboard instruments with the name. The Arabic al oud means the wood or the wooden one although there are a number of etymological theories as well. But in Europe, al-oud became lud, became the lute. For English-speaking organologists or scholars of musical instruments, the lute family refers to any instrument that has strings running parallel to the sound table, like, for example, the modern guitar. But it isn't just English. In Spanish, Portuguese, Catalan, French, German, Russian, Greek, and a dozen other European languages, the basic word for a lute is derived from the Arabic al -oud. Now, the musical cultures of Western Europe have not historically seen the Arab world as an important precursor. European composers, musicians, and scholars have generally understood their music as growing out of that of Greek and Roman antiquity. However, if we go all the way back in European musical history to ancient Rome and before that to ancient Greece, we can find evidence of a wide variety of instruments, lots of harps, lots of lyres, lots of reed instruments, pan pipes, horns, percussion instruments, all sorts of things. But what we don't necessarily see are string instruments like this, short-necked lutes, or bowed instruments like the violin or the Arabic rababa. Those two families of instruments that eventually gave birth to the modern violin and the modern guitar, so central to what became European classical music, both came to Europe by way of the Middle East. While the medieval cultures of the Mediterranean were in more or less constant contact throughout recorded history, and major trading cities like Venice had long-standing Muslim populations from very early on, it's in the Iberian Peninsula of modern Spain and Portugal that these instruments were established in the courts of the Muslim rulers of what is called in Arabic Al-Andalus. I will note here that I'm drawing extensively on work by my colleague, Dr. Dwight Reynolds of UC Santa Barbara and his wonderful recent book, The Musical Heritage of Al-Andalus. Now, you may be familiar with the term Andalusia or the idea of Moorish Spain, dating back to the period when Arab armies conquered Spain in the early 8th century. Of course, the actual dynamics were much more complicated than that. It wasn't really an Arab army, and they weren't defeating Spaniards. The former Roman province of Hispania was a mix of different peoples. Celts, Tartessians, Basques, Phoenicians, Romans, Byzantines, Jews, Vandals, and more. And it was ruled not by Romans or indigenous Spanish groups, but by a small Germanic-speaking Visigoth minority led by King Roderick. So King Roderick's army was defeated at the hands of a mostly Berber army from North Africa by Tariq ibn Ziyad in the year 711. Muslim presence in Spain that began with this victory in 711 lasted some 900 years until the final expulsion of the Moriscos, the converted descendants of the last Andalusian Muslims, around 1610. Thus, 8th century Hispania became a province of the Umayyad Empire, an enormous political entity that spanned all the way across the Mediterranean to its capital in Damascus and beyond to the east. When the ruling family of the Umayyad Empire were overthrown in a revolution in 750, 
All of them were killed by the Abbasid revolutionaries, except for one, a young prince named Abdul Rahman, who, according to the stories, escaped the Abbasids by swimming across the Euphrates, traveling incognito for years and eventually making his way to his mother's Berber tribe in North Africa, and from there into Al-Andalus, where he asserted his claim as the sole surviving Umayyad representative. The Abbasids ret retained control of the rest of the empire, taking the title of caliph and moving the capital to Baghdad. Abdul Rahman I, now in modern Spain, known as Adakhil or the immigrant, established a rival second Umayyad caliphate in Al-Andalus with Cordoba as its capital. The palaces and mosques that were built or begun by Abdul Rahman I are some of the most significant architectural achievements of medieval Spain. Abdul Rahman's caliphate in Cordoba lasted for 300 years before breaking up into a series of Tawa'if or independent Muslim principalities in southern Spain, the last of which continued until 1492. Along with religion, architecture, and Arabic language and science, Abdul Rahman I and his descendants brought a court culture that heavily valued the arts, especially poetry, but also sung poetry and the instruments needed to accompany it. This was most famously performed by enslaved women who were often highly educated and sometimes sent back to the Arab capitals of Medina or Baghdad to train in poetry, singing, and all of the arts. But the most famous musician from the Cordoban court was Ali ibn Nafi, known as Ziryab. Ziryab first achieved fame in the Abbasid court of Baghdad, but ran foul of more senior musicians and eventually fled to the Umayyad court of Cordoba under Abdul Rahman II, a great lover of the arts. We have no written notation for Ziryab's music, but what we do have are many, many stories about his prowess as a singer, oud player, composer, astrologer, mathematician, cook, and fashion icon. He was really a polymath, and the stories about him traveled far and wide. Now, most of these stories are probably apocryphal, written many years after his death by later Arabic-speaking scholars who wanted to liven up the legend. But they're still kind of revealing about how important music was in Andalusian court life. Ziryab was said to have memorized 10,000 songs, to be an expert in all forms of music theory. He built his own oud that was lighter than all the others and added a fifth new string to the four that were popular at the time. He plucked his instrument with a quill made of uh, an eagle's feather and used lion cub gut for the low strings on its oud. He was so fashionable and good looking when he arrived in Cordoba that all the or nobles ordered everyone to get his exact haircut. More importantly, however, Ziryab was renowned for his ability to evoke and manipulate human emotions through his performances. Now, like the Greek music theorists of antiquity, whose writings were translated and preserved in the Arabic language at the great Beit al-Hikmah in Baghdad, Arabic music theorists believed that musical intervals had the power to cause sympathetic vibrations in the souls and bodies of listeners. Some documents describe the first four strings of Ziryab's oud as being colored yellow, red, black, and white for the four medieval humors, gall, blood, bile, and phlegm. Thus, the music of Ziryab and the other great performers of this Arabic tradition was thought to directly interact with the body and the soul to help evoke and control emotions, and even to heal. So the musical intervals in this tradition are understood as mathematical ratios between the frequencies at which a string or the air in the human voice vibrates. And those musical intervals are organized in a set of modes called maqamat. And these were written about by Arabic-speaking theor theorists uh, going back to the ninth century. Um, in contrast to the main modes that you're likely to hear in Western art music today, pretty much just major and minor, um, there's quite a variety of modes, like at least eight being written about in these early centuries, moving up to somewhere in the hundreds, depending on how you want to count today. And there's a couple of interesting things about these modes for our immediate purposes. One of them is that on this instrument, because of the fact that we have no frets here, we're able to play not just the notes on a 
piano, the black and white notes of major and minor. But we can also play notes in between this. So there I played an E natural for major and an E flat for minor. But in some Arabic modes, we've got an E that is halfway, halfway between those notes, an E half flat. That'll sound out of tune to your ears if you're not used to listening to this music, but is actually a natural part of many different Arabic modes. The one I'm playing here is called Rost. So I'm no Zirya, but I do want to play a little bit of music for you to show you how one maqam works. I'm going to play a taqsim that was originally recorded by the great Egyptian oud player and composer 